Lord Isfane, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us today. Um, the role of Parliament and its position on the Brexit process is one that's dominating the headlines following the recent High Court ruling. Can I start off by asking you, given what's been stated at the moment and notwithstanding any appeal made to the Supreme Court to overturn that judgment, what the role of Parliament in the Brexit process would be? Well, I think everybody is um, on pretty much untrodden ground. So uh, making it up as we go along is um, perhaps a little extreme. But as you say, it will depend on whether the Supreme Court in December and the ruling a little later uh, upholds the uh, view of the High Court that there needs to be formal parliamentary involvement in the authorisation of uh, an Article 50 notification. And if the Supreme Court does agree with the High Court, then I think there are two routes that the government could take. One is a motion for a resolution. Uh, and the Times, I think, reported yesterday that uh, there were senior ministers who were urging this course on the Prime Minister. A resolution has some superficial uh, and actually perhaps quite powerful attractions. It's quick. You probably do it in a day. Uh, the selection of amendments would uh, depend on the speaker, but it might not be very extensive, and you could dispose of the amendments at the end of debate. Uh, you, there is no strictly procedural requirement to reconcile any differences between the two houses. So if the Lords were to reject such a motion, uh, but the Commons were to pass it, it might well be thought that that was good enough uh, to fulfil the requirements of parliamentary authorisation for notification. Mm -hmm. A bill, on the other hand, is a rather um, tougher nut to crack because even a small bill uh, would be open almost certainly to amendment. It would depend on the view of the parliamentary authorities. But, for example, amendments for different dates for commencing the provisions of the Act. In other words, if a six-month amendment were passed, then it would simply be that it wouldn't come into force for six months after royal assent. And that would make Mrs May's uh, aim of a, a March notification, March, 19, uh, March 2017 notification, impossible. Um, <clears throat> you would be pushing at the boundaries as to when amendments on commencement dates started to be wrecking. If you had a two-year uh, amendment, for example, I'm sure that would be ruled out as wrecking. The other area of amendment of a bill is uh, to attempt to impose conditions on an Article 50 notification, so that, for example, you could have amendments that said that Her Majesty's Government may not uh, submit a notification under Article 50 before presenting to Parliament its policy on access to the single market, for example. And, of course, given the breadth of material that will come into play on the whole Brexit process, it might be that there was a very wide range of possibilities. The last point to make on a bill, probably, is that there will be a question as to whether it's programmed or not. And uh, it would be, of course, the government might find it very attractive to program it, perhaps give it a couple of days in committee of the whole house, maximum. But the arguments about parliamentary sovereignty, which of course would were deployed very vigorously by the Leave campaigners, might well be to say that, well, if Parliament is going to give a considered opinion on this, it really needs the fullest possible debating, within reason. So you might programme it, but give it a very generous allowance, for example. Programming doesn't happen in the Lords, as you know, so there would need to be a, a degree of self-restraint, I think, on the part of the, House, of the House of Lords. So I think those are some of the main considerations. I would say that a bill is hugely preferable because the worst of all worlds would be to take the resolution route, which, as I say, is superficially attractive, and then for another application to be made to the High Court uh, to the effect that a resolution wasn't a sufficiently, sufficiently high in the hierarchy. Mm. In other words, that the rights, which very much occupied the High Court in their judgment, the rights 
conferred by statute could be taken away only by statute. And if there were to be another legal challenge, well, that would be bad news for the government. I think it would be worse news for Parliament, because in effect, uh, judges will be put in the position, it wouldn't be easy for them, but they'd be put in the position of saying, well, Parliament, you haven't done enough. You haven't done what is required. Uh, and leaving aside the political contention and the high political temperature that would surround that, I think from Parliament's point of view, that would be a very, very unwise and un unwelcome thing of situation to get into. So we've spoken there about the actual possibilities of parliamentary approval for triggering Article 50. There's always the day-to-day -day scrutiny and examination of the government that takes place in the House as well. What are the channels available to parliamentarians to hold the government to account on what it's doing in terms of taking us out of the European Union? I think there are all the channels and all the opportunities that exist to call government to account anyway. Uh, so there's the whole range of, of debate, of parliamentary question, of uh, select committee activity. And select committee activity, I think, is, is going to be crucial. One challenge, of course, is going to be to coordinate it. And although there is that uh, range of opportunities, range of weapons in the, ar in the parliamentary armory, if you want to put it like that, uh, it will also be uh, quite difficult, but also I think quite necessary, to coordinate uh, what is happening. Do you think that could take the form of perhaps the liaison committee overseeing that arrangement? Because I know some organisations like the Institute of Government have spoken about that possibility of the existing body doing it already. Or should that role fall to the newly created DEXU Select Committee, the, the 21 member body they've already set up? Well, the DEXU Select Committee is the obvious place. Uh, there is a question, and you mentioned the Institute for Government, and of course they have. Uh, suggested Hannah White of the inst Institute has suggested that that's actually quite an unwieldy size for a committee. And I agree with her, unless it can operate through formal or informal subcommittees, uh, I think that is a very big committee. But of course, all the other select committees in the Commons, um, and almost all of the departmental select committees, will have some sort of Brexit interest. They will want a piece of the action as well. And that's what I mean about coordinating. It will be a great burden on ministers and on officials just at a time when the Brexit process and the policy formulation, the business of negotiating, even the travelling to and fro is actually going to put a lot of strain and a lot of pressure on them. Mm. Do you believe that the government's position, as, as stated, of not offering what it calls a running commentary on the Brexit process is compatible with the level of parliamentary scrutiny that the committees and the MPs and peers that will sit on them will wish to undertake? I've got a lot of sympathy with the government's view that it's not going to provide a running commentary because a running commentary really means, in effect, having parliament in the negotiating room with you. Nobody would volunteer for that and I can't see it being a particularly helpful aspect. I think it would be very important to pitch the nature of relations between ministers and parliamentary committees just right so that there is um, some confidence and that ministers feel that they can take select committees into their confidence during the process and that confidence is respected because a committee which leaked would really spoil the party for everybody else. But I think there's been a certain amount of um, vagueness about the use of terms because uh, negotiating aims and what you settle for, what you're prepared to settle for, are very different. Negotiating aims, I don't think there is a problem about uh, in terms of negotiation, because after all, that's what you say, it's the first thing you say when you go into the room and negotiate with the other side. It doesn't matter whether it's this sort of negotiation or whether you're just negotiating with an estate agent about the price of a house. What is sensitive and what you absolutely don't want to give away is what you're prepared to settle for. Now, if the government means 
that what they want to keep to themselves is what they're prepared to settle for, I've got every sympathy with that. Mm.